All right, good afternoon, good evening again, everyone, and welcome to the fourth part of our Instagram Live series where at Stag Zeep Wine Cellars we are celebrating our 50th anniversary. Uh, I'm Marcus Santaro, I'm a winemaker here at Stag Zeep Wine Cellars, and I'm coming to you this time from the Fay Outlook and Visitor Center. I'm seated right up here on the patio, and behind me you can see the historic uh, Fay Vineyard and the Palisades up behind me. It's another gorgeous day here in the Napa Valley. And uh, just a reminder, we are open. Uh, I think I mentioned that last week as well. Uh, Stag Zeep Wine Cellars, we, we are welcoming guests back by appointment only. It's a beautiful time to visit the Napa Valley and uh, hope to see you out here. So tonight's topic is one of my favorites. We're gonna talk about the art of aging. Aging is really important to me as a winemaker. It's important part of the celebration when we do celebrate wine. And I'll get into that more in just a minute. But first, I wanna go back a little bit to last week. I know Faye, uh, Kirk and I were really excited to bring you guys out in the vineyard, out into Fay, and show you some of the things that we do. But I know there was some technicalities to bring you out to the farm. So I just wanted to recap a couple things that you may have missed. We talked a lot about the Fay Vineyard last week. And one thing that I don't know if it went, came through or not, but just its historic importance here in the Napa Valley. You know, when Mr. Fay uh, first planted the Fay Vineyard in 1961, you know, there was no Cabernet uh, south of Rutherford. So that's like five miles to the north of us and only 700 acres of Cabernet that were planted in the Napa Valley. Our area was thought to be too cold for Cabernet. In fact, south of Yontville, where the, the sea breezes and the, and the fog kind of lingers here a little bit longer, um, it, it was white wine country, Chardonnay and, and other varieties. It wasn't thought of for Cabernet Sauvignon. But luckily enough, you know, Mr. Fay took that plunge. Uh, he planted Cabernet Sauvignon here and then a few years later in 1969 is when our founder Warren Vernarski uh, and tasted his homemade wine out in his his garage out here and uh, as Mr. Wernarski puts it as soon as Mr. Fay popped open that bottle uh, it was the aromatics alone um, that captivated him and inspired him to purchase the 40 acres of land uh, right next door to us uh, and plant the SLV or Stag's Leap Vineyard that of course won the Paris tasting and then where the Fay property then becomes part of us uh, it wasn't until the mid 80s, until 1986. And that's when Mr. Fay was ready to retire. And he sold that vineyard then to Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. A lot of it, like a lot of vineyards here in the Napa Valley at that time, uh, needed to be replanted uh, due to phylloxera. And that replanting then took place uh, over a period of years. And then our first vintage then, uh, producing a Fay single vineyard Cabernet would have been in 1990. And a little bit later on, we're gonna have one from 1993, which, uh, which is quite exciting. <laughs> Today, uh, the Fay Vineyard is mostly Cab Sauv um, with a little bit of Cabernet Franc, which is a variety that I love to use when you have really nice Cabernet Sauvignon. It's one of my favorite varieties and we've sprinkled in some into both Fay and into SLV. The other thing we might have missed, and I'm, so I brought some things back today from last week, is again, I wanna bring you, what are we doing in the vineyards right now? And in the vineyards right now, we are doing leafing. So I brought one out and grabbed a cluster to show you, this is Cabernet Sauvignon from, might as well get the best if you're gonna go get it, right? So this is from SLV Block 4. Don't worry, this only represents about like a quarter of a glass of wine, so there won't be any big reductions in SLV. But these berries are pretty much sized up where they're gonna be. A few weeks ago, remember we had flowering, and then they were slowly growing. This is pretty much where we're, where we're at. And right now, we wanna get these clusters exposed to the sun. So what Kirk and I tried to demonstrate for you last week was leafing and what we're doing. So we'll try to do it again. This time I actually brought this out, out off of one of the vines. Sorry, Kirk. And what we're trying to do then is remove these leaves from in front of the clusters so that you can get them exposed to the sun. So why is that important? Cabernet Sauvignon, as it ripens, like any variety, it goes through changes, right? And when Cabernet starts out, uh, during the ripening process, it has a lot of what's all called pyrazines. Pyrazines are, if you have experienced a bell pepper, which I'm sure everybody has, that is what is in Cabernet Sauvignon. We need the sunlight then to kind of burn that out and transform it into some of the nice red and black fruit type flavors and characters uh, that we like. So sun exposure is important to that. It also has an influence over the tannins uh, that are within the skins. Uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon or of any red varieties as well. More sun exposure, you do tend to get uh, more tannins or you can get more tannins as well. There definitely is a trick to doing this though because again, we want sunlight, but we don't want too much and we don't want too little. 
It's the, you know, it's the three bears thing again. It's the Goldilocks. And it really does depend then on the block and on, on the row orientation. You know, in the early morning, um, if these clusters are exposed to that cool morning sun, they're gonna be fine, right? But let's say it's the middle of September and the sun is setting and we have a, what typically happens here, a really hot day when these grapes are all purple, they can actually overheat. And so depending on the row orientation, whether it's north-south or whether it's east-west or even somewhere in between, it really is kind of a strategic de decision as to how much leafing to do or how little leafing to do. And it kind of depends on what side of the canopy um, that we're on. So it actually is a little more complicated than just going in and taking off a bunch of leaves uh, and exposing to the sun. And all varieties are different. So, you know, we produce Sauvignon Blanc here, we produce Chardonnay, and we don't leaf those varieties the same way as you would a variety like Cabernet Sauvignon. Sauvignon Blanc in particular is the flavors are highly influenced by the amount of sunlight that are on those clusters. If you were to go in there and expose it like you would Sauvignon Blanc, like we would, like I just showed you with Cabernet Sauvignon, you're definitely gonna get more of a, a tropical flavor and influence uh, on, that, on the resulting wine versus if you kept those clusters all in a shade throughout the entire season, that Sauvignon Blanc is gonna have more of a grapefruity and, uh, and grassy character as well. So that's what's happening right now. Um, the vines themselves are slowing down as to how much they're growing. I showed you uh, a few weeks ago where the, vine, the tendrils were like this, and this is a pretty actively growing vine. I had to hunt to find this out there in the vineyard because most of them look like what you're seeing here, where there's no active tendrils. Um, in fact, their tendrils are actually burned off or starting to burn off. This means that these vines are starting to slow down in their vegetative growth, and now they're gonna focus on the good stuff, right? Now they're gonna focus on the grapes themselves. So that's happening right, right now. Um, and again, for those of you that joined in, I'm Marcus Centaro, I'm the winemaker here at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. Uh, if you have questions as we go, don't forget there's those uh, buttons down there at the bottom of your screen. And then of course, down there too, uh, there is a link to some fun wines that we've made available uh, from our library uh, to kind of go along with what we're doing. Uh, very important. Um, I run into customers around the country all the time, folks that have purchased a bottle of one of our wines and they have putting it in their cellar for a special occasion, you know, for their kid's 21st birthday or a special wedding anniversary. And uh, to me, I take a lot of pride in that. And if somebody has purchased a bottle of our wine, it damn well better deliver when it's time for them to open it for that special occasion. I mean, older wines are, like all wines, you know, they're meant for conversation, they're meant to inspire folks, and they're also a time to, to have memories, you know. Um, in my cellar at home, I don't have a whole lot of older wines. Uh, had too many relatives living too close uh, to clean that cellar out. But, you know, I do have a bottle of wine from each of my kids' uh, birthdays. Um, I have a bottle of wine that, uh, the same bottle that I, when I asked my wife to marry me, uh, I have that when we had dinner that night, I still remember that. And I still have a bottle of that that I'm saving for a special occasion. You know, and when you open those special wines, it's a time to remember uh, things that you did or things that you're gonna do and, and um, Old wines are fun. So that's why they're important to me. So there are some th characteristics though, I think that what is it that gives the wine the potential for ageability? And I think there's three key things. Number one is the site. That's where the grapes are grown. And our site here in Stag's Leap, it produces uh, grapes or produces an, a, a, a weather pattern that allows the grapes to be made in an ageable style. And the key to that, as we went over a little bit last week, is our weather pattern. So I mentioned that when uh, Mr. Fay first planted Cabernet here, our area was thought to be too cold. Well, in fact, it gets quite warm during the early afternoon. The sun radiating off these rocks, the Stag's Leap Palisades behind me, we get nice and warm in here, uh, warm like you do up in the North Valley or North part of the Valley. And Cabernet Sauvignon needs that heat to bring out those nice, rich and ripe flavors that you find in Stag's Leap District Cabernet. But we are south. And so what that means is we're closer to San Pablo Bay and in the early afternoons, like right now, <laughs> you can see the wind, we're getting the cool sea breezes are coming up. The sea breezes, the air gets pulled in through the Golden Gate across San Pablo Bay. And then from the south to the north, it infiltrates the Napa Valley. Later on tonight, right now actually, it is like classic Napa weather. As I'm sitting, I live in Napa. And uh, later on this evening when we're sitting outside eating dinner or whatever, 
you'll start to see the fog that rolls in from the south across the bay and then fills in our valley. So here in Stag's Leap, where we are, the fog lingers till like 9, 9.30 in the morning. So we have this both warm temperatures and cool temperatures. And this diurnal shift is, is pretty extreme. And I think is what is the key factor to why Stag's Leap Cabernet has the potential to age. When we pick, um, you know, everybody has different ways of picking and looking at grapes. To me, it's, it's all about the flavor, right? Um, but if you were to look, let's say, at a technical standpoint, uh, at the numbers, like what is the sugar level? What is the acidity? Um, when we harvest uh, Cabernet, like these vines right behind me, the sugars don't tend to be too crazy, but the flavors are ripe, and the grapes themselves still have a lot of really nice natural acidity. And that's because of the cool nights. So that gives that nice natural acidity uh, in the grapes and then that results in the, or that then transfers over into the resulting wines gives the wines then potential for aging. So site is key. Not all sites have it. Um, our vineyards though, when you taste wines from SLV anyway in our cellar back into the 70s, uh, Fay Cabernet, I mean in our cellar it starts in the 90s, but obviously there were wines that were produced before that. Um, you can see it. Um, the wines can last uh, and they maintain their personalities uh, as they age uh, as well. Number two then is the style. And the style means that's what we do to the wines uh, here in the cellar um, into how we ferment them, you know, how extract, how much I extract or don't extract, the techniques that we use. And I have always found that to make the best wine, we need to match the style to what the vineyard gives us. So it's pretty easy for me in terms of winemaking to take grapes that maybe want to be made as a more elegant wine and I can make them more tannic. You know, I can bleed out juice. I can be a heavier. I can ferment at a hotter temperature. Um, I can really, really be be uh, be violent. Let's say with the with the grapes themselves to make that wine more tannic. Likewise, if we have grapes that come in being very, very tannic, you know, we can use winemaking techniques to make light and delicate, easy wines. But I always found that when you do that as a winemaker, the wine, resulting wines become more awkward. And the best thing to do is to match your approach or your winemaking approach with what your area gives you. So Stag's Leap District Cabernet has, again, this soft power. Um, they're rich wines, they're really complex, complex wines, but they don't tend to be too over the top and too heavy. And that is what I'm looking for in how I ferment and how I blend. It is this term, this balance term. And um, it's important, I think, when we talk about ageability to remember that a wine doesn't necessarily need to be undrinkable in its youth to be ageable. That was a key. Um, that was a key teaching. I remember him telling me that directly. That at bottling, they're like they weren't necessarily like these big, massive tannic wines. They were soft, but they were balanced. And those wines have aged together very gracefully and very, very slowly. So that's really the key. The idea with aging is again, when you open that bottle, it's better than it was when it was bottled. And that does not necessarily mean that the wine is undrinkable. Um, at its youth. When everything is in harmony, when you go into bottle, then it's going to age harmoniously in that bottle. So what happens during aging, right, there's a few things. Number one, the tannin, so the structure of the wines, that softens and silkens. And then the fruit, the fruit, the really bright fruity texture and taste that you get from a young wine, that also evolves. It changes from being, being like fresh fruit to having other tertiary aromas like floral and cedar notes and other real complex type characters. Um, and, with, and if you go into bottle with the right proportion of both, then as they age, they're gonna age together. And then again, when you open it, those things will still be harmonious. If when, at bottling, you have, let's say the wine is really, really tannic and not really fruity, then when you open that wine 30 years later, you're still gonna have a wine that is still tannic and then all the fruit's gonna be gone. So that's why it's important at bottling to have that balance between the structure and the fruit uh, and then to have that potential. So that's the style. So site, style, the last thing is the cellar. And it's, this might be one of the more uh, technical aspects, but there's things I'm talking about in the cellar that we do here, and there's things that you do in your cellar uh, at home as well. So in our cellar here, you know, we age these wines in barrels. And barrel aging is part of the cellaring. It is, the wines are aging as they are in oak. Uh, we use really tight grain French oak. So not a whole lot of air is actually transferring through the barrel during aging. We keep the cellar temperatures here really cold. 
Um, the other really important aspect, maybe one of the more boring ones, but is that bottling. Bottling is tricky. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, uh, and today, I mean, we, we fill these bottles. There is such care taken to be sure that, you know, it's just nitrogen that's in the bottle before we actually fill the wine. Uh, we fill the wine and then we put a little more nitrogen in and then there's a vacuum that sucks everything out and then the cork goes in. It's such a careful and precise procedure and it's, um, it's important though. Um, if you were during the bottling process, let's say, just fill it up, smush the cork in, uh, that wine then is going to be inundated with, saturated with three to four times the amount of oxygen to be just like splashing it back and forth. Um, and that obviously is not good for the potential for ageability. So the cellar then also means that once the wild ha has left here and how it's stored. I think the best way to store wines, I do think it's good to keep it on its side. You know, whether or not that cork is going to is going to stay or just to keep that cork uh, nice and moist. Um, but I think an even temperature is important. So whether it's at 50, 57 and a half, 63.6, um, I think the key is just maintaining a nice smooth temperature. Um, if you have temperatures that are going up and down all day long, think of it, the wine's expanding and contracting. So it's breathing out and then breathing in, and that's breathing, doing that through the sides and through the cork. So even temperature, um, obviously not too warm. I mean, I, I think there is a limit, you know, probably under 67. Uh, would be good. Cooler is going to slow slow down that time and definitely try to keep that bottle of wine um, outside of the sunlight uh, as well. Don't put it on top of your fridge. Just try to find a place where it can be aged nice and smooth uh, and, and even. So those are my th uh, three keys. Um, it's really exciting for us here, uh, you know, for myself. Um, but my assistant winemakers too, Jorge Ramirez Perez, Luis Contreras. You know, I opened the wines that we're going to try here. Uh, uh, a little while ago uh, so that we could all try it and everybody around here gets excited. Um, it's fun to reminisce about what we were doing in 1993, 1995, 1997. Uh, Luis just mentioned he actually helped bottle the 95, was working in the cellar in 1997. Um, and um, the fact that our wines do have potential for ageability is, uh, it, it's, it's important. Um, so why don't we uh, go into the tasting here? So. Um, the first vint wine that we're going to try then is the 1993, 1993 Fay. There we go. Let's show you the bottle on that. So uh, I opened these bottles um, a little bit before and I just wanted to remind you folks of kind of some of the better tech, best techniques that I think uh, when we're gonna open a bottle of, of older wine. I do like to use, this is a Durant, but really one of the key parts to this is to use this guy right here. Um, this is called an Asso that you really just gently kind of rock down uh, the sides of the bottle and then you very carefully lift the cork out. Um, before, as you're getting ready to open an older vintage, I would recommend that you take it out of your cellar at least a few days beforehand and stand it upright. That just allows the sediment um, to kind of settle down uh, to the bottom of, of the wine. And by sediment, that's this stuff that is right here on the edge of this cork. So what is that sediment? It's gonna be, you know, things that are, that are, that are part of the wine. They're, they could be potassium crystals, could be little bits of, of sediment left from, um, uh, you know, from the grapes themselves totally harmless, but you probably don't want to have a full glass of it. Um, with decanting, decanting is kind of an interesting topic um, and how you, how you do it and also the time limit. And really it does depend a bit on the wine. So with younger wines, I do like to decant those, uh, meaning that I'm going to pop the cork and maybe pour it into a decanter to get a little bit of air into it, maybe let it sit out for an hour or so. Those wines are young and a little bit of air isn't going to hurt them is going to help to bring out some nice fruity characteristics um, and kind of soften those tannins. With older wines though, again, it's a little bit of a debate. Personally, I like to open the wine, decant it off the sediment, and then taste it right, and taste it quick. The wine can always open up in my glass. Um, and I don't want to lose uh, those first few moments or those first few fresh notes that may fade off as that wine ages off in a decanter. That's the way I prefer to do it. I so, have a question on decanting. If 
there a certain age uh, where a wine doesn't need to be decanted? All right, the question is, is there a certain age when a wine doesn't be decanted? And that is a total crystal ball question because it really does depend on the specific wine and the specific producer. You know, um, you know, I'm fairly familiar with our wines, let's say, uh, because I do open them up, uh, older vintages, fairly frequently. So I kind of have an idea. But at home, you know, and it really does, if you have a, a vertical or if you open other people, folks' wines, you might have some of that experience. So, you know, my recommendation with that, and if you do have special older bottles of wine that you're planning to open for a special occasion, get a hold of the winery. I mean, I personally, I keep a running list of whenever I've tried an older vintage of one of our wines, how it's looking, how it's doing, and whether I would drink it or whether to hold it. And that is something that we're happy to share with folks. And I know a lot of wine, most winemakers are passionate about their wines and about how they age. And the wineries themselves too would be happy to answer specific questions about that. If I was to make a generality, it would probably be in terms of like sedimentation. Usually you're good up until let's say 20 years and then past 20 that's when i usually start to look and take care of do i how much sediment that there might be, wind up being uh in a bottle of wine it's a great question uh tough to answer <laughs> but but there we go uh so Faye, um as we talked last week we tasted all different you have a personality and it's something that you find in the older wines and then something that you can draw a line to and you can see in the young wines um, and one of the things I love about this is particularly on the taste and the texture. What Faye is about, Faye has this perfumey red fruit note, this bright berry pie, and this really soft and silky tannin structure. And when I taste this vintage of, of, of Faye, it still has the bright berry pie notes, but particularly the aftertaste is when that perfume kind of comes back up to my tongue and kind of like grabs it. And um, I love it because again, that's what we're, I'm working right now with the 2018 wines. And that is that character that I'm trying to capture uh, in 2018 and in the young wines, uh, the young wines as well. This wine has aged really lovely. I mean, if folks had this, all the wines right now in the mid nineties are really kind of at their peak, I think for us. If someone was to call about this wine, it still has plenty of fresh fruit left. It's something that could still age in your cellar as well, um, but would be really fun to, oh, I'd be pretty tempted to open it. I think it it's, tasting, it's tasting great. I'm often asked uh, which age is longer, uh, Faye or SLV. Uh, we have a cellar that goes back to 72, 73 with our first vintages of SLV, so we know that can go. Uh, Faye, our first vintage again was 1990, so that's as far back as we can go. But I know um, there were single vineyards produced from the Faye Vineyard, from other producers in the Napa Valley um, that I'd love to get a hold of and, and try. So the next wine that we're going to try here, this is now we're going to go over next door to SLV. This is from the 1995 vintage. Now both 1993 and 1995 in the Napa Valley, uh, both the springtime, the weather was a little dicey. So there was some rain, uh, there was some wind, there was a little bit of shatter, uh, which again, shatter, that is when the grapes are first setting. And when you have crazy weather, not all of them pollinate. You can see here's two of them right here on this cluster. We also had some crazy weather uh, during bloom that don't pollinate. So that, that caused in both of those vintages there to be uh, lower yielding. And then they had fairly warm uh, temperatures during the summer. Um, but both were really long growing seasons and um, produced really nice wines. This 1995 SLV, uh, for me, this is the, I've had this wine a few times here in the last few years, and this is why you age wine. <laughs> you, you, when you smell this, you get exactly what you would want if you had been this patient and stuck this in your cellar. You still get the SLV characters, the dark, the, the dark fruit, uh, the dusty cocoa powder, the violets, but it also is kind of wrung by this little bit of a, of a floral note and like a, like a tobacco character. That is a characteristic you get from wine as it is aging. So this has a really nice proportion of both of those characters in the aromas.
and fresh, juicy, long um, filling. I mean, SLV has more of a, a, a tan tannic character. It's a richer wine, and definitely between these two, it also has a real really fun. Uh, I'm glad we get to do these because I get the opportunity to open some of these wines. Someone uh, had 95 and 98 on Father's Day since you just touched on 95. How, how, what commentary do you have on the 98? Sure. Vintage? 98 was a much cooler vintage. And uh, when I tasted 1998, it also was holding up really well. Um, but it has more of a brighter acid edge to it uh, than 1995. It's something that you can definitely, well, you said you opened it, but maybe you have another bottle. And if you add another bottle, uh, you could definitely stick that away for another uh, 10 years or so. So again, every vintage is different. And that's one of the neat things about wine and winemaking and viticulture and, um, and why, you know, why these vineyards are so special because that 98, it also had, you could tell that it's SLV, right? Um, it had some of the dusty cocoa, that mineral, that graphite character in the nose. But the taste is where those two, the 95 and the 98 would have been different. 98 was a much, much cooler vintage. So in, when you taste it, when I tasted that 98, it had more bright acid character to it. Um, it wasn't quite as ripe, let's say. It has the characters, but on a little more of the not quite so ripe edge versus let's say uh, 1995. All right, last but not least, opened up a bottle here of 1997 uh, Cast 23. So we did the story of Cast 23 a couple of episodes ago, but the quick refresher is uh, our first vintage producing this wine would have been in 1974. Uh, that's when uh, our founder, Warren Vernarski, and uh, Andre Telechev, who was consulting at the time, uh, were tasting through all of the barrels of just SLV, came across one they thought was so superior that it needed warranted being bottled on its own. And so they did, and then named it after the barrel number or the cask that it was being aged in. So cask number 23. So up until 1990 then, cask would have been just the finest example of the wines from the SLV Stag's Leap uh, Vineyard. Starting in 1990 though, uh, when Faye became part of Stag's Leap Wine Cellars, cask 23 changed as well. And it changed to be a wine that's about complexity, trying to capture both the perfumey red fruit notes of Faye and the dusty dark fruit notes from SLV in the same glass, but also being a wine that's about in tremendous intensity. And by intensity, I mean the length on the finish. That is what the key to cask really is, is and what takes it up to another notch um, uh, above in terms of quality. That is what, for me, uh, really defines a top quality wine is the length of the finish, that long lingering aftertaste and for our, these two vineyards, Faye is the more elegant one, SLV is the more powerful one. And so it's really fun for me uh, to try to find that fine line between those two vineyards to get that perfect balance, uh, to get that, that, and when you have it and you can ride it, then you can create a wine that has that long lingering aftertaste that really makes it great. So versus uh, 93 and 95, I mean, 1997, a warm vintage, and a really long vintage and very different from the 1998 that we were just talking about the subsequent year when the weather was much cooler. So 1997 definitely has a riper side to it. Um, and when I smell even this cask, this has a lot of dark, a lot of dark fruits, like almost like dried cherries, like you open up a bag of those like dried blackberries, dried raspberries. Um, taste. It's a, this is a powerful wine. Still has a lot of structure. Um, this is something that that can can. This is a this is a big wine. Uh, this is something that could sit in the cellar for another probably 10, 10 to fifteen years, and is also a really good testament, I think, to what I was talking about with sight, sight and style. Nineteen ninety seven wines uh, from a really warm vintage like this. Uh, they may some there are some thoughts that uh, these wines are not going to age they're not going to hold up this is a great example you can even see from the color really a fun wine we have someone who said 2013 through 16 have been touted as great vintages um what are you seeing for 17 and 20 in, in terms of 
how they're doing. 13 through, well, I guess through eight, through, well, through 17, that's what we have in the bottle. Uh, next week, we're gonna be a string of really nice years, and the wines have a different texture though. 13 is a power year. Uh, 13, uh, we had a dry time of the year, and then just a really long, well, not long, but a warm, but even growing season. That is a power year for Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, that my biggest challenge in that year was again trying to get that soft the the, the softness to the find, finding the balance between the softness and the power but on the more it's a more powerful vintage uh, those wines are aging very very slow um, quite well the 14 wines are a little more accessible and if you had 13 at home i'd save it uh, 14 those that vintage was more accessible very similar weather during the end of the growing season but different in the beginning in that in the beginning it started out super dry and then we did wind up getting some rainfall uh, in April and May, which propelled more vegetative growth. The berries in 2014 were a little bit larger. Um, and so the wines, although they have a lot of nice complexity, um, they have good structure. They definitely are softer, let's say, uh, than 2013. And those wines, I mean, if you had a six pack at home, I, I, I might open one now. They're drinking quite nice. They still will have, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, a wine doesn't necessarily need to be undrinkable in its youth in order to be ageable. Um, but when I'm looking at, let's say I had a six pack of something and I wanted to open a bottle, I think adding six or seven onto what the vintage is um, is probably a pretty good starting point. So you got 2014, 2014 plus six, 2020. Might be a fun time um, to open one of those wines. 2015, a little more dramatic year. Uh, again, we had small berries, uh, kind of wild weather during set, um, and then we had a fair amount of heat uh, during harvest. So it was a quick harvest, low yields, darker fruit, bigger structure. Uh, those wines, um, I, I actually really like those wines right now, but I would probably hold them for a bit. Um, again, if you, only, if you had just one bottle and you were going to age it. The 16 vintage, 16 long growing season, uh, cool during the summer. Uh, the sea breezes, the fog, I mean, it was, I was the only one outside barbecuing during that summer. Um, but then long season at the end, right? In September and October, the weather was beautiful. Cabernet likes to have those nice long seasons. That's where you can get, make wines that have a lot of complexity. It's a balanced vintage. It's a, the tannins in 16 are a little bit bigger than 14, not quite as, as powerful as 13 or in 2015. And then the 17, um, you know, we'll talk a lot more about the 17 vintage next week. Uh, definitely was a little bit more of a dramatic vintage, but in terms of structure and power, uh, the 17 wines uh, have definitely, uh, they're in terms of structure, more like the 2013 vintage uh, overall. So, you know, all these vintages, we've had a really nice run. Um, I, I, there, there are no issues in keeping any of those wines in your cellars uh, for 25, 30 years easy. Um, I would expect them to age uh, very much. Uh, we have a power vintage here with 1997, substantial tannin, softer years here with 1993 and 1995, and both are have aged uh, really beautifully. Got a couple questions on 2012. Um, how long can we age those wines? 2012, that's a more of a balanced vintage. So a little, little um, you know, coming off, 2011 was a very, very cool vintage. The vines were pretty, pretty rambunctious in 2012, uh, pretty full crop. Um, those wines are very, very balanced. The growing season was boring, um, warm, you know, warm throughout. Just a, you know, maybe it was the, it was the the reprieve from 2011. Um, I've been, we had 2012 actually last week uh, with Fay, and um, you know, our wines they they tend to, they're, I mean, for lack of a better word, they're kind of lazy as they age. You know, 2012 as well. It, I, you know, obviously I ha I've, I've had that wine you know, periodically, and it doesn't change very much. Um, I think it has great, you know, great potential to age as does any. It is softer though. And so um, again, if you were to look at, uh, you had a bottle or you had a couple bottles and you wanted to enjoy, you, you weren't gonna go 30 years or something like that, um, 12 Fay or SLV or cask would be fun wines to open at, at this stage being eight years old. Got an interesting question on white wines, um, like good white burgundy. Um, what are the aging outlooks on Caria or uh, Arcadia? Sure. So the question is about aging our white wines. So we produce uh, Sauvignon Blanc. We produce a couple of different Chardonnays. We produce Caria. 
uh, which of course Caria means graceful. Um, that's the style for that wine. Then we do a single vineyard uh, from Warren Vernarski's vineyard down in Coombsville, the Arcadia Vineyard, uh, which is made in a, in a very different style. Uh, you know, our white wines, and you know, I'm not um, saying you shouldn't, that you have to age those wines. <laughs> you know, whites are when you open the cork when they're young, they're vibrant. And I'm not looking, I don't think in those Chardonnays, uh, Caria, I would probably open that wine within seven years of the vintage. And I think you're gonna get that, you know, part of the experience with white wines is that fresh fruit character, um, is that nice bright acidity. Arcadia is different. Arcadia is something I think you can hold on to for longer, probably 10, 12 years. And um, Arcadia has more of a brighter acidity to it. Um, it's grown in a really special place. It's a it has a lot of the marine influence, cool nights. Um, it has the really nice, delicate, like honeysuckle and white peach type aromas, um, bright acidity. And if stored correctly, and white wines, again, with white wines, you have to be, I think, even more careful if you're going to go with ageability than reds. You definitely need to keep those wines out of the sun and in a nice, even place. And I think Arcadia, 10 to 12 years, or within 10 to 12 years, I would be my recommendation. What are we doing with these wines afterwards? Can you recork them, or are we just going to enjoy them? We're going to enjoy them. <laughs> we, uh, we uh, uh, again, my crew. I mean, we produce wines for folks to enjoy, and uh, to be enjoyed tonight at dinner, or to be enjoyed at a special as a special occasion. We take great pride in producing wines that are ageable, and we also take great pride, and we want to experience them too. <laughs> So uh, a lot of my cellar crew, they got a chance to taste these wines. We have some folks here with our wine club uh, as well that uh, uh, I don't think these will last past a couple hours. <laughs> thank you for the question. Okay, well, thank you very much again for, for the questions, for joining me. Remember, next week will be our last uh, in this Instagram live series where we're going to talk about the 2017 vintage. Uh, just a reminder that we do have some library wines uh, for sale uh, on our website, which I think there should be a link to. We've got 08, 09, 2010 cask, and a couple other wines uh, as well. And for those of you that like these, uh, and a little later on, I think 5.30, uh, with Karen McNeil, uh, it's one of our friends. We're gonna be doing a, uh, another Instagram uh, seminar where we're actually gonna talk and taste uh, 2017 if you wanted to join in. So cheers to everyone, and thanks so much for joining me. <laughs>